let's again plunge into another kind of adventure in which we will try by, by the way uh, Saturday night I, my wife she was watching one of the last uh, uh, lectures was uh, not to waste time I just urge you, and for the first time I sat down to see, I hate to see myself, but I sat down with her for a whole hour and a half, and I tell you, it's a very good lecture. It's, it's very good. You should watch all they're all very good. Ah, but I couldn't, I didn't believe that it was, it was that good, I mean, to me. If I, if I say that it is good to me, it's unbelievable. very flowing and everything was to every kind of ears any kind of ears so it's worth it to go through all the lectures that we shouldn't be just uh, uh, heating the, the bag when it's empty it makes noise but there is nothing effective so it's good to, to see it tonight we will discuss a topic that perhaps not many discuss nevertheless when the issue comes up in any kind of discussion you will see that the discussion is inflamed and people they are very inflamed with the with this issue everybody knows that there are today everywhere in the world those institutions that we call not only yeshiva but also the kolelim where people spend all their days sometimes all their nights also studying Torah and the question is being asked by many people is it okay to to spend your life studying without working what are we supposed to do let's say you are a good Jew you are mindful about the obligations that the Torah expects from us. We understand the important task of learning Torah for the Jew, as we have discussed so many times in the past. But what about spending all your life, all your days and nights in learning? Is it feasible? Is it something advisable? Here is a young man, he marries a, a beautiful woman, and he tells her that, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to just learn. Of course, there's no problem in that case, because he cannot do that unless if she agrees. She is the boss, automatically, you know, in those circles where you have yeshiva uh, people or kolel people, you know, you have today, you have thousands of them tens of thousands everywhere and the world wonders how is it possible to especially today when everything is so uh, expensive how is it possible to raise a family when in most cases only the wife works and the money that she makes is not too much but they all make it somehow they make it and they have beautiful houses and they have beautiful children and many children. So now the question is, is it advisable? Can we tell any young Jew who is religious that his obligation is to go and learn and that's it, not to work? Of course you know the answer, that's not a good advice. So how come it's, am I going now to project the idea that I am against this when I know that not only the Jewish people survives because of that the state of Israel survives we believe because of those people who study Torah day and night of course it has to do with your faith whether you believe in it or not and I, I definitely if one has all the capabilities and he has Parnassah I mean, he has some kind of living, in other they have some kind of a source of money, even if it's not too much, but at least there is a definite source with which he can raise the family. 
and the wife doesn't have to take all the burden on her back, then of course, why not? But in general, are we supposed, are Jews supposed to work or not? We say that the Jewish people is a nation of Torah. The day when we received the Torah at the mountain of Sinai, we have signed a contract with God. That, Ki hi chayecha Torah is your life. So what does it mean? Does that mean that we should not, that working is not something that is advisable? Perhaps it's not the best choice. Maybe working is only for people who are not too important. What should we say? What should we answer to this question? Without, God forbid, I'm not saying that to do it is not good because so many are doing it and because of that we have, thank God, oh please, thank God we have leaders of Torah that, can, that definitely can tell us how to conduct ourselves and uh, you know, to be posek halacha. For that you need people with great talents and great minds and those minds uh, cannot uh, be used for any kind of work but the study of Torah. But I'm talking here about a small minority. But what about the big majority of the religious young people? Should we tell them, no, don't work, go to yeshiva. Just learn, that's it. Of course, this is possible in the early stage of the learning, why not? But are we supposed to tell them that even after they get married, they should go and spend all their days only in learning when the wife is taking the burden of making a living? This is not very popular, of course. Forgive me. Did I succeed? So that's the subject. Is it good to work or not? Is it good to become a doctor? Is it good to be a teacher? Perhaps it's better just to learn Torah since this is the goal of the life of the Jewish people. So what should we say? So we are going to uh, explore this subject to its various facets and see what we can do. According to the Talmud, you know, when we find in general the idea of the Talmud is definitely that people should go to work. It says in the Talmud, Gedol Amelacha, the profession is extremely important. We find in the Talmud in Masechet Kiddushin, on page Kaftet Lamed, Chayav Adam Lelamed Umanut Libno. Each father has a moral obligation to do several things. I can quote from the Talmud in Masechet Kiddushin Kaftet, page 29. Here are the obligations of a father towards his son. And the list goes on like this. Ha'av chayav bivno lamulo. Number one, the obligation of the father is to circumcise his son on the eighth day after his birth. Everybody agrees with that. It's the obligation of the father. Unless, by the way, just to discuss this one more minute, just in case the father did not circumcise his son, then the son, when he grows up, by the way, the alternative is the Beddin. The Beddin should take care of his circumcision. If not, if he is in a place where there is no Beddin, and he realizes now he, you know, there, there, there are many Jews who are like this, they found out that they were not circumcised. So it, it becomes their own obligation. But the primary obligation of the person is that the father is under the obligation to circumcise his son. That's obligation number one. Obligation number two, the Talmud says, Velifdoto, also to perform on the 30th day after the birth of the child, to perform the Pidyon Haben, to bring a Kohen and to redeem 
his son from him. Otherwise, the son belongs to the Kohen. Everybody knows that. You know, you give to the Kohen five pieces of silver, and that's how you redeem your firstborn. Talking only about the firstborn, as everybody, but that's not the issue. The third obligation of the third obligation of every father you will be surprised and I'm talking an obligation bound by the Torah which means a father who did not fulfill his obligation in these matters he has incurred a sin it's a sin the father must take care of the brit meal of his son he must make sure that his son the firstborn was redeemed, the Pidyon Habe. And the third obligation is Lelam Medo Torah. The father is under the obligation to teach his son Torah. Of course, you can ask me, what about if his father cannot? He doesn't know if he did not learn Torah. And now he knows that he has the obligation to teach his son Torah. Well, he, he takes a teacher. He sends him to yeshiva. When you send him to yeshiva, automatically it's considered, and you pay the tuition, automatically it is considered as if you have taught Torah to your child, to your son. And by the way, let me just tell you, let, let me just interject in this issue that the Talmud tells us that there are two fathers to every uh, Jew. The father who brought him to the world, which means the physical, the biological father, and also the spiritual father who is the Torah teacher. When you study a certain amount of years, Torah from the same person, that person, he has, you have to respect him as you respect your father. In fact, to a certain degree, the Talmud tells us the following. What happens if your father Exactly at the same time, the same time, your father and your Torah teacher, your Rebbe, both of them, they lost something. And now they ask you to go and search for what they lost. Whom are you going, whom are you going to serve first, your father or him? The Talmud says you have to go and take care first for the lost item of your Torah teacher. Before your father. Don't, get, don't be hurt, my friends, because the point is very simple. That is only when the father did not take care at all of the Torah education of his son. In that case, then, the Torah teacher in the eyes of the Torah is higher than even the biological father. Why? The father brought you to this world. The Torah teacher brings you to the world to come. Not that he kills you. But he is going to give you the, the eternal life because of him, because he teaches you Torah. So automatically you will never die. Understand it any way you want. But that's the point. We believe in that very much. And since the world to come is eternal, and this world is only a few years, so automatically that's why the Rebbe, of course if you are several years with him, if most uh, our sages said that if the majority of your knowledge of Torah comes from him, then automatically he, he is, he precedes your father, he has priority. Except if the father, even though did not teach you Torah, but he paid for your teaching, he sends you to yeshiva and he paid for you, automatically your father now gets both crowns, the crown of the biological father, and the crown also of the spiritual father. Even though you have a teacher, but your father comes first. Why? Because he pays. Once he pays, it, it, once it, it took charge of your education, then automatically the credit goes to the father. Of course, we still have to respect the Torah teacher, but no more priority to the Torah teacher in case the father uh, got his son to the yeshiva and paid for the tuition. That's why, by the way, it's good to pay tuition for yeshiva. It, it, by the way, I'm very serious about it. It's very important. Of course, the, the, the institution should, should really think a little more than charging heavily 
upon everyone in such a way that is sometimes abusive. But in some cases, what can they do? But still, it's good to pay for the Torah learning of your children. Why is that? Because that's a specific law that we find it in the Talmud that is, has been already uh, uh, established by the Rambam, Maimonides, and it says there, Ha'av, the father, Chayav bivno, lemulo, velivdoto, ulelamedo Torah. As, to, as he has to give him circumcision and pidyon, he has to teach him Torah, whether through his own teaching or through a teacher or yeshiva. The fourth obligation is o isha to bring him a wife. Huh? What a generation we live in today! Huh? Can you do this? In the old time, that's how, that's how it used to be, and in some circles today is the same also. The father, of course, together with the mother, but the father is has the obligation. He cannot let his son his, his son go uh, unmarried. He must go and provide him with a wife. Now that doesn't mean that he will bring him anyone and then uh, he, sh he should command his son, you take her, whether you like her or not. There's no such a thing. Because there is a certain statement in the Talmud in Masechet Kiddushin on page 41 where it says that you must see her so that you will love her. And otherwise you are going to marry someone that you don't love. Then you are going to. What are you going to do with this? With the commandment, that the Torah says you, love, you have to love your fellow Jew like yourself, and your fellow Jew, the first one, is your wife. So therefore, of course, but to a certain degree, the obligation of who brings the girl to his son, the father. Okay, today, if we want to interpret this in modern terms. It would mean that the father provides for his son the expenses of the wedding. Of course, to the best of his ability, we are not going to kill the father and the mother, that they have to give their life, or they have to become uh, indebted for life for uh, the wedding of their son. Everything according to the means of everyone. But the obligation falls upon the father to pay for the for the, when he pays for the wedding, it's like if he brought him his wife. But truly, the original words of our sages are that the father has the obligation to bring a wife to his son. Which means, up to 20 years, he must keep on harassing his son. My son, you must marry. To a certain point, our sages said, if he is a Talmud Chacham, then he can wait until 24 but after that, he had, he, he, the father must become a little bit angry at his son. Another obligation, and that's the subject of tonight. Ule lamedo omanut. Another obligation of the father is that he has to make sure that his son learns a trade, a profession. He must know how to work something, to do something make a living. And that's again another obligation of the father towards his son to teach him to work. So here we have a definite statement by our sages that not only allows us but obligates us to work. And then we'll have to come later to the question, so how come there are so many rabbinical students who spend their life just learning? Don't worry, there is an answer to this. But you have to know that in ancient times there is no such a thing as uh, one should sit and only uh, and learn. He has to make sure that he has parnasa. He has to bring all the means of making a living to his, to his home. But our sages respected very much the idea of having a profession. I used to tell my daughter all the time. He didn't, I mean, he insisted on, go, on going to the, to the university, fine. So now you learn philosophy, you learn history, you learn, you learn English, very nice. But it's good also to go and learn a little profession. Maybe today, computer, programmer, or something. 
If not, then the old fashion is to <laughs> to to teach them to teach them to do some kind of profession, to be a shoemaker. Doesn't sound very popular today to be a shoemaker or to be a tailor or to produce things with your hands. Very important. Because what happens if times change? And then you find yourself with nothing. No job, no nothing. When you have a profession, there is almost a certainty that it, you'll be able to be used. The world will use you some, somehow. And finally, the last obligation of the father towards his son, the Talmud says, Ve'yesh omrim af lehashito benahar. To teach him to swim. <laughs> You should know that to teach your son to swim, your children to swim, is an obligation. Our sages explain because this has to do with life. In the old time, everything was done by crossing either the ocean or rivers. So, uh, if you didn't know how to swim, whenever a tragedy occurs, yeah, that would be a terrible thing. But if you know how to swim, perhaps you could save yourself. Anyway, the Talmud tells us in Kiddushin again, until when can you learn Torah? And rather, do you wait until you get married, then you start learning? Or you have to start learning Torah before you get married? Apparently, the decisive opinion in the Talmud is that you should learn as much as you can before you get married. And the Talmud tells us that it's good to get married at the age of 18. However, if you learn Torah, we'll allow you 20. If not possible, 21. If not possible, 22. Then maximum 24. By the way, that does not mean if you pass 24, you don't get married. You still have to do your best to get married. But our sages put it in such words that if you pass 24 and because of your own reasons, which means you have the possibility to get but you refuse to get married, then Hashem says, okay, I retire from you in this business. Let his bones fly away. Which means it's only an expression to show that now it's not going to be with so much with the help of God. The truth is it's only an expression, but always God helps, no matter what and when. So the question is, why is it that they decided that you should learn Torah before you get married? The Talmud says, Rechaim yasok Torah. How can you learn Torah after you get married? After you get married, you have a burden on your shoulders. You have to work. Now you are going to start learning. That's not good. It, it does not mean that it's impossible. In the Ketubah, normally, to, tonight we had a wedding here. So they read the Ketubah. What is it that we read in the Ketubah? In the Ketubah we read all the responsibility of the husband towards his wife. And one of them is that he provides support and sustenance. It is true that today in modern times, every rabbi goes to the wife also, I mean to the bride, and after he makes the groom sign, he goes to the bride and he makes her sign also that she should take also some kind of responsibility. Why? Because today both of them work. You know, everybody, yeah, that's not in every case, but my wife doesn't work. But at the same time, most of the world, that's how it is today. In that case, so we can ask also the wife to take some kind of responsibility. But the bigger responsibility always falls in accordance with the laws of nature, the husband. So therefore the ketubah is replete with, with uh, commandments upon the husband that he should carry on his responsibilities, not only to respect her and to cherish her and to love her, but also to sustain her and support her, her throughout life. 
So now if he that if he's not going to go to work after his wedding, who's going to have to go to work? So the Talmud says, Rechaim Betsabaro, we are Is it possible that the yoke of the and the burden of making a living is upon him and now he's going to go and learn Torah? So we understand from all this that our sages definitely their opinion is in favor of working. Is that mean not learning Torah at all? No, God forbid. It's impossible for the Jew to spend one day without learning at all. It's like if you stay without eating. Can you stay one day? It's very difficult. Two days, three days without food. That's almost impossible. Well, the same thing also for the Jewish soul. To stay without learning Torah, whether it is a lecture or in a book or learning in yeshiva or in the synagogue, it has to be some kind of learning. Otherwise, the Jewish soul suffers tremendously. Well, at the same time, you have to go to work. The Talmud is replete with stories, extraordinary stories, about people who had to go to work, and yet they became great leaders of the Jewish people. One of the, one of the stories we find in the Talmud, Masechet Ta'anit, I think it's 21, page 21. And there is, they are telling us the story of Abba Chilkiyah. He's a man, a normal man, who apparently was extremely powerful in his prayer. People came to him when the, the, when the rain, when there was no rain. For a long time, there's no rain. In the land of Israel, that was catastrophic. Finally, when they see so much time elapsed and no rain, they came to Abba Hilkiah. Abba Hilkiah did not take upon himself any rabbinical positions. He was a worker of the land, of the field, a very poor man, and never distinguished himself in anything. In fact, the Talmud tells us that whenever he saw the rabbis coming to him to ask him to pray for the rain, he would hide. Maybe they can find somebody else. But the Talmud tells us that whenever they reached him, and he prayed, he prayed, the rain fell. And the Talmud tells us that when the two rabbis who came to look for him, they had to go to the fields and they found him working very hard. I'm not telling you the whole story because that's not the subject. But the idea is that how a great man who has a reputation of a person who practically to, to, to such a spiritual level that by, just by praying immediately he gets what he wants. And yet, he did not stop from work. In fact, when those rabbis saw him working, the Talmud tells us that those rabbis hollered and they said to him, Hey! Hey, sir! He, did, he refused to answer. So they waited and they waited until he finished his work. And then when he came, he acknowledged their presence. He still didn't say anything. All he said is shalom. Now they went behind him all the way to his home. His wife, the Talmud tells us that his wife came out from the house, beautiful and everything, adorned with cosmetics and everything, to welcome her husband. And they went in the house. Those rabbis, they don't dare say a word. Now they, want, they, they are going to be invited to eat. They were invited to sit down. And the man... Rabbi Abba Hilkiah, the miracle performer, is taking the bread. He has a few children. He cuts the bread. He gives a big piece to the firstborn and another piece to the, to the other child. The Talmud brings it in, in, in a way that we don't need now to mention. And only he left something for... And he left the, the last piece for the guests, which apparently doesn't seem to be very inviting. I mean, is this, uh, is this how we are supposed to receive a guest? Our sages are very clear about receiving a guest that we have to practically serve him all the way. But anyway, finally the Talmud tells us that those rabbis, finally they were able to hold him and tell us the answer to several questions. The first question is, when we came and saw you working in the field, why didn't you acknowledge our presence when we said hello? 
He said, if I say, so he said to them, I did hear you. Please forgive me that I did not acknowledge your, uh, your he hello. But I was working. And if I just responded to your call, that would be considered like if I have stolen from my, my boss. I mean, that would be a second, right? But that second I would rob from, from my boss. And that would be considered stealing. And therefore, now this for us sounds extremely exaggerated. I understand. And probably there's not much into it. But perhaps in ancient times, in these kinds of circumstances, if he said hello, you would have to come to them. And then he would stop a little. It did happen to me, by the way, here in New York, uh, many years ago. In the early time when I was here in New York, 20, 25 years ago, I knew someone in Brooklyn. Rabbi Khaliwa, Zichrono Livracha. I called him when he was working. He did not even answer. I said to him in the night when I finally found him, why didn't you answer? He just picked the phone and said, hello, sorry, and then he closed. He says, I can't. It's at the expense of my boss. That would be stealing. Now, who, who does uh, calculate his uh, steps in this manner today? How can we, can we find anybody who does this? You know how many times people work in a factory? They allow themselves to make phone calls. They allow themselves to use uh, pencils of the, of the place. They allow themselves to do many things. In most of the cases, probably it's okay. But sometimes, you never know, this might be considered robbing the place of its time, which is precious. But every, all this does, uh, comes, number one, to teach me one thing. That even the great sages worked. They worked very hard. Another story in the Talmud, in Masechet Brachot, we find that when in the Sanhedrin, the great rabbis, 71 rabbis, among them, of course, the president was Rabban Gamliel, who was extremely rich, and he had servants. Of course, he had the great wisdom of Israel, no question about it. But at the same time, there, among the great rabbis who were there, was one by the name Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananiah. And he was even the, I, I did mention him, his name several times in the past, and he was the advisor of the emperor of Rome. And yet nobody knew how he made his living. Everybody thought that he probably is very rich. Because of a certain, uh, of a certain dissension that happened among them, and Rabban Gamliel was deposed because he lacked respect to Rabbi Yoshua ben Hanan. Yeah? The next day, Rabban Gamliel went to look for Rabbi Yoshua ben Hanan just to apologize. He kept looking and looking and looking until finally he found him in a hut. It was a very small place. When he went in, everything was dark, full of grease. And, and he found the rabbi there working so hard. He says, Rabbi Yoshua, you are our, one of our, I mean, perhaps the best member of the Sanhedrin, of the great rabbinical a committee that we had then. There's not one page without mentioning the name of Rabbi Yoshua. And this is how you make your living? By producing needles, he had to make needles one by one. That's how he made his living. And he was all black. So Rabbi Gamliel was like a king. He knew only the life of servants and things. When he went, he couldn't understand. He says, Rabbi Yoshua, this is how you make your living? So Rabbi Yoshua said to him, I'm sorry for you, Rabbi Gamliel, that you, don't know, you do not know how the Jewish people makes his living. You should know that there are also cases in which you have to work. What can you do? In fact, Rabban Gamliel himself said in Pirkei Avot, Yafe e Torah im derech eretz. Which means the best way to reach perfection is to have them both. Derech eretz means working. To have a profession and to work. But at the same time also to learn Torah. I don't want to sound tonight like if I am against the idea of only learning. <laughs> of course I am for it. But depending for whom, depends who you are. What are the circumstances? Are you going to 
allow such a thing that you will decide to go to learn when your wife is going to stay home with the children and living a terrible life of, uh, uh, of uh, a life of poverty I have to quote what the Rambam says the Rambam says in Ilchot Talmud Torah chapter 3 he says the following כל המסים על ליבו שיעסוק בתורה ולא יעשה מלאכה anyone who decides only to learn Torah and will not occupy himself with any kind of work ולא יעשה מלאכה ויתפרנס מן הצדקה and the only way for him to survive is by accepting charity from people this so called rabbi has profaned the name of God he has brought shame upon Hashem upon God and he humbled he embarrassed the Torah and the light of the Jewish religion is extinguished because of people like this please do not jump to any conclusions yet because we will come to explain also the second uh, the second facet of this talk but in the meantime officially people have to go to work there is no such a thing as just deciding to go and learn all day just because you feel that you, see, you are so enthusiastic and you, I want to go to learn and I don't care what happens in the family or you might just say well I believe in God and God is going to provide by you know four years in the desert the Jewish people did not have to work remember when they received the Torah and they went through four years in, in the wilderness I mean they didn't have to work they didn't have to do anything the manna came that was their food from heaven their clothing never deteriorated it grew on them it was clean all the time because of the Anan Hashem you know that uh, the, the, the smoke the great pillar of, uh, of uh, the cloud that was going with them it uh, practically ironed everything so there was no problem so some people might think the same way today and they might say well I have emuna. I have faith in God, and if I go to learn, God will provide. You know, some people have this kind of, uh, of philosophy in their mind. God will provide. God doesn't like this way. If you have a source of money, or if you are sure that somebody is going to pay you, like today, for example, the Torah institutions, they pay. There is a salary that goes to every, there is a payment that goes to every Torah scholar. That's why there is no problem. When you go to a college, you know you are going to receive a thousand dollars a month, five dollars, five hundred dollars a month, plus whatever the wife can do, and it's fine. And that's what they do today. But if there is some meshuga who would come and say he has no source of of, of, of no money, no nothing, and he has many children, and his wife is at home, she doesn't work, she cannot take all the burden upon herself, and he decides, I have faith in God, and God is going to provide me with everything. So you might say, so what? He has faith. What do you want? God does not like that. God wants everything to go according to nature. Nature requires that you have to go to work and make money. Whether it is little or, 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 or a lot of money, it's up to you and up to whatever you have designed for yourself. But one must work, must find a job and work and not rely on God to, uh, to send him food and whatever he needs from heaven because the four years in the desert that we read in the Torah is a different situation as soon as they enter the land of Israel they themselves they had to go and work the land you know Rahmin, you'll be surprised to hear that our sages said that one of the reasons why the Jewish people made this kind of problems remember the story of the Meraglim the spies 
you know, for which even today we have to suffer for that old sin that they, when they sent the spies to spy out the land of Israel and they came back with a report that was catastrophic and Hashem became so angry that he decided they will not go to the land of Israel and they have to spend four years in the desert until the last of them will die and only their children who were born in the wilderness will go to the land of Israel in the, under the leadership of Yahushua bin Nun and Kaleb bin Yehunim. right? But you know, what was the problem with the Jewish people? How could you, how is it possible that... So some of the sages say they didn't want to go to the land of Israel. They didn't want to go to the land of Israel? The promised land that God has promised and take, and that he has taken away from other nations, and gave it to the people of Israel, promising them that it's going to be their place of inheritance forever? How come? The answer is very simple, because they, they got used to the, to, to the life in the wilderness. No worries, no preoccupations, you don't have to go to work, food comes to you every day. You know, the manna came, and the manna was very delicious, and if you had faith you could have in it any kind of taste, any kind of food that you desire, you find it in the manna. If you want steak, all you have to have is a little bit of faith. When you take that manna, which, which, uh, which uh, uh, seems to be like a little piece of cake, you, ta- you practically taste steak or whatever you like. So they didn't have any worries. And therefore, as we call it, the biggest kolel, the biggest Torah institution of all the generations was those four years in the desert. That's why we call that generation Dordea, the generation of the mind. Because we could never have a generation like this. The generation of the wilderness, after they received the Torah and they spent four years in the desert, they were well taken care of by God and they loved it. But they knew that once they will enter the land of Israel, it's over. Then they will have to take care and make a living to work the land and to provide for themselves no more manna. You know, the manna fell only for four years, that's all. All that, was, that remained was a little cake that, that stayed as a reminder and was, uh, was, uh, was shown in the first, in the first Beta Migdash. The second Beit HaMikdash didn't have the, the, that sample of the manna. The sample of the manna kept in a little bottle was during the first uh, Beit HaMikdash, the first temple. After that it disappeared. And that's where people saw with their own eyes the manna that kept falling every day except Shabbat, because on Friday it fell twice, I mean twice the amount, and that's how people survived And it was a life without any preoccupation. What did they do then? They learned Torah. And they learned and learned. And that's all they did. Day and night they learned. And that's why that that generation was the generation of knowledge. But immediately after that, after that, they were supposed to go to the land of Israel and work. God did not say to them, hey, you are going to go to the land of Israel, but... No work for you. Let the goyim work for you. No such a thing. The Jewish people was told that they have to work, and that's the reason why so many of them didn't want to go to the land of Israel. They said, we live this, this life is godly. We are so used to learn only Torah and to be so much in contact with God himself, and now we have to go and become like normal people? We are not anymore normal people. That's the reason why they refused to go. And God was angry because part of the obligation of the Jewish people is to go to the land of Israel and work work it. By the way, it's important even today to go to to Israel, either to live there or at least to build a house there, to buy a house. You should have a house. Doctor, you should have a house in Israel. Okay, I mean, rent it until you go, whenever. You know, I have a house in, in Jerusalem, a beautiful house, Baruch Hashem, in Givat Shaul, in Yerushalayim. And it cost a lot of money, and now it's worth a lot of money, much more. 
But that's the point. The Rambam says that there are four ways how to uh, fulfill the law of Yishuv Eretz Israel, the establishment of the land of Israel. One of them is to go and live there. Number two, to have a house there. Number three, to visit there. And number four, to fight for it. If you go to the army, for example. So, anyway, let's not uh, go away from the subject. Just, by the way, it's good to go to the land of Israel. Even just to walk four steps in the land of Israel is very important. Our sages said, Kol amihalech arba amot. Be'eretz Israel yesh lo chelek le'olam abba. If you just walk four steps in the land of Israel, you already are entitled to the world to come. Which means you will have eternal life. After uh, gain on. <laughs> well, listen. Uh, everyone has to pay according to his deeds. Unless if you do tshuva, you do tshuva, everything is forgiven. Fine. But it has to be a serious teshuva. But if you don't do teshuva and just you walk for the steps... If you are going to go and desecrate Shabbat there, I don't know if the land of Israel will help you. When you go to the land of Israel, you go there to to ensure that sanctity and uh, tradition is kept in the land of Israel. But we are talking about the importance of work. Work is very, very important. So what happens today? How come so many go to learn? That's okay. Because there is a new thing in the world. Baruch Hashem, this generation, Hashem gave us many, many rich people. Many people who are capable of paying, of giving big donations. And you know, our sages said, En hatzibur ani. The whole congregation is never poor. Even if everyone is poor, everyone will give. A little bit, and then you have a sum you give to yeshiva, and the yeshiva can progress, and can, they can pay also the kolel to those Torah scholars. But that doesn't mean that everyone is allowed to do that just because he is uh, lazy, he doesn't want to go to work. We're talking about people who once they enter the kolel to study Torah day and night, they have to be so serious, they have to be special. Not everybody can, can do that. You think everyone can take up upon himself a life of Torah, learning day and night. They think it's a, it's a life of a, of a lazy person. God forbid. It's a very hard life. It's not easy at all. You know, there is a, lo- a small story by the Chafetz Chaim. One day, the Chafetz Chaim, he, Rabbi Israel Meira Kohen, famous tzaddik, who lived approximately 70 years ago in Radin, Russia. And today the Chafetz Chaim, even if there's a yeshiva Chafetz Chaim, in, a prestigious yeshiva of Chafetz Chaim, and, you know, on, on his name. The Chafetz Chaim, so many books were written about him because he was, a very, he was a very saintly man. And he was a great man also. One day, in his yeshiva, so they needed some, re, some repairs to be on the roof. So he brought Two people, Jews, who do not learn, but their job is to work on the roof. You know, the roof was open because they were trying to replace uh, all kinds of pieces on the roof. So through the opening, they saw how people are learning downstairs. That was the place where people learn. And on the top, those people work all day long under the sun. And then, throughout the days, they realize that those people who learn, they get their payment every month. At the end of the month, they receive a nice amount of money. Not too much, but uh, a plausible amount of money. So those two people said, hey, these people, they have an easy life. They sit down and learn. That's all they do all day. And at the end, they receive a payment. When we spend all day under the sun and we receive almost the same thing, what is this? This is not fair. So they came to the Hafez Chaim and they told him so. Rabbi, they said, oh, we want also to be like them. We want also to learn. So he said to them, do you know Torah? You know how to learn? They said, no, we did Oh, okay. 
You don't know how to learn Torah. You know how to read Tehillim? He said, oh, of course we know how to read Tehillim. All right, I'll hire you. You come to the yeshiva, don't work. Just sit down and, and learn day long, read the book of Tehillim. Yeah, we're very happy. That's all. Very good. Very good. But the first day they came, and they read Tehillim until it came out from their soul. And the second day they came and begging Rabbi Chavetz Chaim, no, 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 we cannot take it. It's too much. So he said to him, this, he said to them, so now you realize that studying Torah, now even Tehillim, which is easy, you are not capable of doing it uh, two days. Now you want to study Torah or, or Torah all your life? You understand this is not for everyone. And that's the answer to the question. The answer is that we are not here projecting the idea that it's not good to learn Torah. Has shalom. Our life is to learn Torah. The Jewish people is alive today because of the Torah. If there was no Torah knowledge, in all the centuries there would be no Jews today. It is a historical fact that cannot be denied. Impossible. That the Jewish people would be in existence today if people did not learn Torah. Because of those groups who learn Torah, that's how our tradition is known to everyone, and that's how we keep living as Jews. But at the same time, it's not for everyone. What is for everyone? For everyone is go to work eight hours a day. Make sure you don't work more than that. More than that is not good. It's not good to work too much. The Jews are not made for working too much. Eight hours is already a maximum. If you are a doctor, that is something else. Maybe you need to, to do more because people need you. If not, make sure your profession makes you work no more than eight hours because you need your koach to spend the rest of the day not in playing golf or watching TV, but rather to go and learn Torah. So what is now the beautiful Jew? So Rabban Gamliel says, Yafe Talmud Torah im derech eretz. The beautiful Jew is the Jew who wakes up in the morning, he washes his hands, he says, Mode ani lefanecha, he says the blessings of the morning, he takes his tefillin and talit and he goes to the synagogue every morning. After his prayer, he sits down to learn, provided there is a shi'ur or whatever, or he goes to a place of learning, one hour, maybe two hours. If he can make it for three hours, even great. According to Maran, the Shulchan Aruch, three hours is a minimum of learning. And then he goes to work. He goes to work in the evening. Now it's evening. He comes directly to the synagogue to pray Mincha. And then Arvit. Or maybe between Mincha and Arvit to have a shiur of Torah. And now he goes, after Arvit, he goes to, to see his family enjoy his children and his wife and to sit and eat with them and so forth and to give proper uh, educational uh, recommendations to the children and make sure they go to sleep and everything and now it's already almost 9 o'clock in the night he goes immediately to the kolel and he sits down again for another hour or two depending on his capabilities and that's the beautiful Jew that doesn't mean you don't go to weddings you have to go to wedding, you have to go to weddings. You have to go to an engagement party, fine, that's okay, be my guest. And uh, you want to go to a Brit Mila, fine. As long as the majority of your days are spent in such a way. Working, no question about it. But at the same time, if you can learn Torah in the morning, even if it is just one hour, okay. And in the night, another hour, it's very important. Especially that you make sure that the day has some Torah and the night has some Torah. And that is by the, somebody will ask you, what is the beautiful Jew? That's the beautiful Jew. Otherwise, working also is a big problem. You know, so many people, they give 16 hours to themselves in business. What are they doing? Okay, they make more money, big deal. But money, 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 after day after day, life is short. And the time comes when you see you made so much money and now 
You cannot even enjoy it that much. You are too old. You are so busy. Why being so busy for something that anyway is ending? When you can acquire, if you do the procedure properly every day, with discipline. I'm not saying that there is no need for discipline. There is a need for discipline in everything. But if you put in your mind, if you plant in your mind, as deep as you can, the importance of having a knowledge of Torah every day, like you take breakfast, you spend some time for breakfast and some time for supper. At that time you give it also to, to Torah learning, you are considered the beautiful Jew. So what about those rabbis who study all day? That's a minority. That's a different situation. I'm not saying that it is chas shalom. We live because of them. We survive because, because of them. Make no mistake about it. That rabbi who has, for, who, who has a great mind, and he could have become a great doctor, or he could have become a great engineer or a great businessman, and he forsook everything for the purpose to go and learn Torah, use his talents and mind only for Torah, when he gets only a few pennies with which he makes a living, that guy is the source of our life. So I did not project the idea that it is negative to learn Torah all day. What I am trying here to say that this is only for a very small minority. We cannot, our sages did not speak for that majority, for that minority. This minority is essential to our life, to our survival. Without them you cannot have a Chafetz Chaim. Can you have a Vilna Gaon without them? Can you have a Rav Ovadia Yosef without them? Can you have a Rabbi Ben Chaim without, I'm sorry, without them? It's impossible. And there is no future without the great minds of Torah. There is no future. So they give us a future and life. But we are talking about the majority of the Jewish people. The majority of the Jewish people, they have to go to work. Work is kosher. Work is good. Not too much though. Too much is already not kosher. That does not mean... Of course if you could work three hours and the rest you could learn. If you could make enough money from those three hours, that's the best. There were many great people who did it. You know, I know somebody, Chronoli Bracha, he passed away a few years ago, a great doctor in France, in Paris. He was also a Mohel, by the way. And he was a tremendous Talmud Chacham. And for many years, he was a Talmud of my great cousin, Rabbi Yaakov Toledano, the famous Rosh Hashiva of Paris. He practically saved the, the, this generation of Jews in, in France. He's the, 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 of Merkaza Torah, Rabbi Yaakov Toledano cousin of mine and his doctor was a mohel and his personal doctor that was this this man and this man could make millions but you would never be able to find him until one o'clock one o'clock his office opens and that's when he had many clients that coming uh, to him mamash with the help of god was a very rich man and everything and he raised a beautiful family big family of Torah scholars you know I don't think that there is anyone among them who has become a doctor maybe one of them is a doctor but the rest is Talmide Chachamim why? they had the, the mind they, had, they were geniuses and he himself could have made so much money between 8 o'clock in the morning till 1 o'clock in the afternoon and instead he chose for at least the last 30 years he chose to sit down and learn Torah from 8 o'clock after the prayer of the morning till 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock he opens his office. Does that mean that he became poor? No, sir. He wasn't poor at all. Now, I'm not, going, I'm not telling you here this is what you should do. All I am trying here to project is that every Jew, ah, what a great thing it would be if today, when most of the Jewish people is not religious, you go to Israel, terrible, terrible of course Baruch Hashem you have hundreds of Torah institutions today like, unlike any generation before but at the same time you see the majority of the Jews there profaning the Shabbat go to Tel Aviv is this the land of Israel it's unbelievable at the same time we have to love it and we have to pray for them and everything but at the same time the land of Israel is very holy 
It's the land of God that it does not tolerate the profanation of the name of God through the profanation of Shabbat and so forth. Only we hope that soon all this is going to come to an end, to a good end, of course. How? In the coming days, there, will, there are more and more people who come back to their traditions and, and Torah. And today they count, you know, like half the population is already religious today. Maybe not so much some of them, but they are already on the way. What's going to be? I'll tell you the truth. It's possible that overnight everybody is going to become religious. Am I telling you something that is, not, uh, that is stupid? I tell you the truth. The Rambam says in Hilchot Tshuva, Perek Zayn, 7th chapter, paragraph 7, he says, and the, the Rambam was not a prophet, he was a great posek, a halachist. He does not make any drashot. He says the law, and he says, you will see how all the Jewish people will make tshuva. They will all come back to their traditions. Now, we are already in that time in which apparently all the prophecies are going to come through the, the, these coming years. And it's not going to be easy, my friends. Life is not going to be easy soon. Prepare yourself for a life that is harder and harder. Only let's hope that it will not be too hard. But it's bringing with it a new wave, a new air in the world, a new atmosphere. Number one, in the, in the land of Israel, hopefully without big wars and without destructions, hopefully the Mashiach will come on clouds of glory rather than on clouds of darkness. And the Jewish people will all become religious. Now what does it mean to be religious? Does that mean that you will not have doctors? No. It will mean that every doctor that you see has a nice kippah on his head. And today you see them, Baruch Hashem, in profusion. In Jerusalem and wherever you go, you go to the hospitals, half the doctors are with the kippah on their heads. And it's, it looks nice. It looks nice. I don't care if the kippah is small or big. In some, I have my own student, Dr. Baruch, Shaul Baruch. Oh, hi, Shaul, how are you? <laughs> He's a big doctor in the... In, you know, he learned with me Torah for 12 years, every morning, every morning. And when he came to see me, I remember, I hope he's not watching. Uh, when he came to see me, him and his wife, they were not religious at all. At all. They came to, find, to buy tickets for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. And they were still very young. And, and Baruch Hashem, we became friends and he became religious. And then he became, he is now a Talmudic scholar. He's a, he's a good uh, Talmud Chacham. And he's one of the best surgeons in Sha'ar Tzedek, Yerushalayim. One of the greatest surgeons of, of, uh, of Yerushalayim is uh, Shaul Baruch. My friend and uh, student. He wishes me to say that he is uh, my student. So what did he do? He gave away a few hours of his time every day for learning Torah. Today he's capable to open the Talmud himself and understand. And he, he is a doctor with a beard and a hat. <laughs> with a hat, a real hat, a hat, a rabbinical hat. Anyway, and his wife was a big lawyer. And today she raised a beautiful family, and she has uh, her. Uh, she's very religious. They live in uh, in Bet Shemesh, in uh, Ramot Bet Shemesh, beautiful place. All religious people. Now that's the point. The point. I'm not saying that everybody has to become like this or like that. The point is that if Jews will understand that every day there is a daily quota of Torah that must go into your head, like if you, st if you eat your breakfast, we are saved. The Jewish people is saved. Then we will have nothing to worry, not about this monster, Ahmedinajab, not about the nations, not about uh, our enemies. Everything will fade. You know, we cannot even blame our enemies. You think we hate them. We shouldn't hate them. They are not doing anything against us. It's Hashem who's playing with them. It's Hashem who's making them do what they do. 
You think Ahmadinejad, the, you know, the Persian president, when he says, I want to destroy Israel, you think it's him who says that? It's Hashem through him. He wants him to say that, so that some, every day, because of those announcements, because of those declarations of this monster, there is another Jew that does Teshuvah. You don't believe me? Every day another Jew makes Teshuvah. Maybe two Jews, maybe three Jews, maybe three families became, are becoming religious every day because of his declaration. And that's the point. When we hear, you know, every day today you hear, you know, like Olmert, Ehud Olmert just declared yesterday in the Knesset that soon the war that is coming is not going to be like any war before because even the civilians are going to be involved up to their ears. Not anymore like they used to fight our enemies uh, outside the land of Israel. Now the war, we are going there because with their missiles all pointed at us. So now when you hear those things, what do you do? Some people will run away from the state of Israel, but they don't. Baruch Hashem, they don't. They stay. The Jews are special people. It's amazing. But at the same time, those declarations and those situations and those circumstances, what do they do to, to our mind? They make us think. They make us say, who am I? If I was born a Jew, perhaps I'm not doing what I have to do. To be born a Jew and to live like a Goy, isn't that a waste? Why did you have to be born a Jew if you are going to live like a Goy? I mean, it's very simple. It's a very simple and logical thing to think about. I am a Jew. That means I'm going to be hated by the whole world. Is it worth it to be a Jew? But I was born a Jew. I love it, they will tell you. Even the worst Jew will tell you, oh no, I am a Jew. But at the same time, with what are you a Jew? You put tefillin every day. Is your wife going to the mikveh all the time, once a month? Do you do what is? Uh, do you wash your hands before you eat? To, uh, you eat? Do you eat kosher? Do you say Baruch Ata Hashem al Netilat Yadaim? Do you put tzitzit and so forth? Those are the obligations, normal obligations, of the of every religious Jew. And now we have learned tonight that while going to work is beautiful and important, no question about it. But at the same time, working is very important, but at the same time, learning a little bit of Torah every day is very important. Now, women also, the same thing. Now, I'm not saying the same thing because women are not under the same obligation of learning Torah, but what the amount of books that they have to learn is so big that the, if they want to learn all of them, they will not have time for anything else. So they have enough Torah to learn. Even though they don't have the obligation to sit down and learn Gemara. Why? Because there is a danger with the Gemara. The Talmud, there is a big danger with it. You know, we study Talmud every day. I teach Talmud every morning and every night. Two different tractates. Every day. You know what happens to the people when they learn Talmud? They become infatuated with the Torah. They fall in love with the Torah. Taking that away from them, it's like taking their life away. Mamash. Learning Torah becomes, when you learn it in depth, when you, you, when you every day you struggle to understand what the meaning of every word that the Talmud has, little by little you fall in love with it. And then it becomes part of your, not part of your life, it becomes your life. And then what happens if women also will go today, Baruch Hashem, the women have, could have better minds than men. And then what happens? If they will fall in love with the Talmud, maybe they will not fall in love with, the, with their... No, no. But what I mean is, maybe then they will not uh, take care of... Uh, they will not want to get married. And, uh, and they will not want to raise a family. Or they will be too busy in learning rather than bringing children. I'm not, I don't mean, I, I know it doesn't sound very popular what I'm saying, but the truth is that life is life and logic is logic and God created women to 
bring children to the world. And to bring children means you have to take care of the child and everything. And can you... Today they try to make the husbands also taking care of the children. It doesn't work, my friends. That My wife tried it on me. It never worked. The baby, I kept holding him. He doesn't stop crying. As soon as she takes him, he stops crying. So you see that women are better. Now, I'm not saying that today it's very difficult to say those things that I'm saying. Because today women are equal in everything. Not that they were ever, they were any time before not equal. They were always equal. In fact, according to the Torah, the woman is much more important. She is considered a carrot by it, the essence of the house of every Jew. And only when it comes to learning Torah, so you have to be careful. If women will start learning the Talmud, they will fall in love with it like men do. And then their natural obligations will suffer. In other words, things that we think that women have to take care of things that are very important in life, and they will, start, they will not be so much after that. Let me just conclude by saying the following. In the Talmud, in Masechet Evamot on page 63, we find that there was a great man. I was telling you about falling in love with the Torah. When you read the halachot, you don't fall in love, but you learn, you acquire knowledge. But when you learn Gemara, you find out that we many, many times we learn things that are not relevant to today. Like today, in this morning, I was talking, or last night, yesterday night. I was talking about historical matters that used to be in Beit HaMikdash when people, three times, when the Jewish people was under the obligation to go to the land of Israel, to, to Yerushalayim, to Beit HaMikdash, three times a year. And then they would have to bring a korban, a sacrifice, a uh, 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 burnt offering, uh, and also peace offering. That they, and all this has nothing to do with today. But when people are engrossed with the study, they forget that we, we are not, that it's not relevant anymore. So we immediately we, be, we feel that we are living that time. When you study it in the Talmud, it's like you go in, certain, in a certain trance. Like if you go through the time, and when we discuss those matters, we think that we are right there. That's what happens when you learn something in great depth. And that we cannot allow such a thing that women will also fall in love in such a way. And today, you know, you found in the history of Israel, there were several women who went on that direction without being affected, such as the wife of Rabbi Meir, Beruria. She was known as a great Torah scholar. And other women also throughout the history of the Jewish people. So there was a rabbi, as I was mentioning before in the Talmud in Yevamot, by the name Ben Azai. He never got married. To some opinions, he got married one year and that's it. But he's known as a person who never married. When they told him, Rabbi, you are teaching us the importance of getting married. He was teaching the day, there was a day when he was teaching the importance of bringing, to the, of procreating. Piria Verivia. And you have to get married because of that. So they, said, so they said to him, Rabbi, you are teaching us to procreate, to bring children to the world, and to get married. And you yourself, you are not married? How is it possible? Nae doresh velo nae mekayem? Oh, you are a great lecturer, but you don't fulfill what you say. They said to him. He answered, Uma e'ese. What can I do? I fell in love with the Torah. What does it mean? Everybody falls in love with the Torah. We do every day. But him, he was such a great genius. He was one of the greatest genius in the history of Israel. Even though he was the disciple of Rabbi Akiva, so perhaps Rabbi Akiva was the only person who could, who could have competed with him. But Ben Azai himself, we don't call him Rabbi Ben Azai because he never even went for a rabbinical position. All he said was, leave me alone, I want to study, that's all I want, my books. This man fell in love so much with the Torah because of his mind, he had an extraordinary mind. So he couldn't get married. He said, I cannot get married. What, what happens when you get married? You have to have love. 
our sages said, and the Torah says that you must give love to your wife. You have to love her. And she has to love you. Now, love is something that can be divided in many ways. You have love for women or vice versa. You have love to, to go and visit the world, to travel. You have love of food. You have love in many kinds of things, in art, music. Some people say, my life is music. The others say, my life is art. And the Talmud Chacham says, my life is Torah. But we all, most of the world knows how to divide that energy that we call love in many ways. We are capable of giving our love to our wives, our love to our children, our loves to our family, our love to our car. Sometimes people fall in love with their car. Don't you know that? I know a guy who's crazy about his car. I told him, marry him. There are people who love art and music and so forth. And everybody finds room in his heart for, for everything. There was a very big exception. Ben Azai was such a great genius that he fell so much in love with the Torah he could not love anything. He says, how can I get married without love? My love, all, all of it was completely dedicated to Torah. So our sages said that's the only exception that we can take. No one is allowed to say I am like Ben Azai. Everybody should do everything and if you say, even though Ben Azai will leave him alone because he was a, an exception of all the rules. But at the same time we had another, I'm going to finish right now in two minutes. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The famed revered Rav 2,000 years ago, the disciple of Rabbi Akiva, who gave us the book of the Zohar, which is the source of Kabbalah, the knowledge of Kabbalah. He insists in the Talmud that one should only learn. Because he says, if you are going to go to work, then you are going to be attached to the world. In that case, what's going to be with the Torah? So that was his opinion. But Rabbi Ishmael re, said to, he was against his opinion and he says no the best way for the Jew to find perfection is to have it both work and learn these two opinions are brought in the Talmud Masechet Berachot which I couldn't find the page tonight and they are making history and the Talmud tells us those who followed Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai did not succeed because there were those who were enthusiastic to say, if Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that all you have to do is learn and food will fall from the sky. So there were many people who were enthusiastic and they tried. They didn't, it didn't work. But those who followed Rabbi Ishmael working and learning did su succeed. Rabbi Shimon Ishmael al Is that mean that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was not correct, Rahmin? No, God forbid. What it means is that it's not for everyone. Learning Torah day and night only is not for everyone. You have to be a special guy. By the way, if you have also someone to give you, I mean, a monthly check, that will help. But at the same time, it takes a very special man to dedicate his life to Torah completely when his mind could have been used to become a doctor or to become a professor or whatever. And he could have had a beautiful life. And instead he chose a Torah. This is not for the majority of people. But we are talking about the majority of Jews. What are they supposed to be? They have to learn a little and also work. Torah yafa melacha. The Torah together with work. That's a great combination and a wonderful thing. Now girls, when you will get married by Ezrat Hashem... May Hashem bless you with a wonderful future. He will make sure that your husbands, if he does not decide for a life of Torah completely, then don't forget. Make sure to interfere with his life and to tell him, did you go to your shiur today? And don't forget, you cannot go to work without taking a shiur. At least make sure you learn every night. 
If you do this, your life will be a blessing. It will be a pleasure. And then the children grow. When they grow at night and they, say to, they talk to each other and they say, Where is Abba? And the son, the little guy, answers proudly, My father is in the kolel. He's learning. He knows that he has to go after he eats. After he came back from work, he comes, he eats, and now he goes, he runs to the kolel. That's the perfect Jew. May it be so for everyone. Amen. Mm-hmm.